you've seen that the distance radio waves can travel and how good they are at getting around or through obstacles depends on their frequency. You've also learned that radio waves of different frequencies can be used to carry information without interfering with each other. So how then do radio waves carry information? In this lesson you'll meet the three main types of modulation. Amplitude modulation, frequency modulation and phase modulation. To build a simple communication system you could use a rapid succession of sparks to generate a stream of electrical pulses. The electrical energy could then be made to flow through a suitable antenna. Each spark would result in a damped electromagnetic wave. In reality the random nature of the spark generator would create a rather messy signal of mixed frequencies. However, by interrupting this signal systematically with an on-off switch, messages could be encoded within it. You could, for example, transmit messages in Morse code. If these radio waves were to strike a similar antenna, a receiving antenna, they would induce an electrical current in the metal, which could then be fed into an amplifier and then to a set of headphones. In fact, this is exactly what Guglielmo Marconi did for the first time in 1897. He transmitted the first ever radio message in Morse code from Flat Home Island in the Bristol Channel. His assistant was able to receive it immediately from Lavenock Point near Cardiff, almost six kilometres away. The message said, Are you ready? What followed over the next few months was a series of similar demonstrations proving that Marconi's radio telegraph signals could be sent and received at increasing distances without wires. Marconi found that he was able to expand the range of his transmitter by increasing the size of the antenna and the amount of power supplied to it. He didn't realise it at the time, but he had created sky waves, capable of travelling great distances by bouncing off the Earth's ionosphere. In 1901, Marconi sent a message from Paul Dew in Cornwall to St John's in Newfoundland, a distance of over three and a half thousand kilometres. His radio telegraph soon caught the attention of the Royal Navy, who helped him to develop a commercial wireless communication system. But Marconi's spark gap transmitter created very messy radio signals that monopolised a wide range of frequencies. As more and more people began to use it, it became more and more difficult to separate one broadcast from another. Not only that, but its application was limited by the fact that you could only transmit coded messages. On the 24th of December in 1906, from Brant Rock on the east coast of the USA, the Canadian-born engineer Reginald Fessenden used a new type of radio transmitter to broadcast human voices and music. His Christmas concert was heard hundreds of miles away. Fessenden had invented amplitude modulation. With amplitude modulation, a microphone is used to capture the sound and convert it into an electrical signal whose voltage varies with time, rather like the chart you can see here. This is referred to as the modulating wave. At the same time, an alternating current is used to generate a clean, continuous wave whose voltage varies at a constant frequency and constant amplitude. This typical sinusoidal wave is known as the carrier. Using a relatively simple electronic circuit called a mixer, the carrier wave is modified according to variations in the amplitude of the modulating wave. The resulting wave has a fixed frequency but, as you can see here, the so-called envelope of the modulated wave follows the outline of the modulating wave. In fact, you can see this shape twice. Here it is again upside down. Since the new modulated wave is oscillating at only one frequency, the tuning circuit of the radio receiver is able to filter out pretty much everything except this particular signal. 
Furthermore, the modulated wave is oscillating at a frequency that will travel more easily through space than if the original signal hadn't been modulated at all. Once the modulated wave has been transmitted and isolated by the receiver, it can be demodulated using a circuit known as an envelope detector. Normally, when we think about waves, we think about the way the amplitude varies with time. To put that another way, we normally describe waves in the time domain. But an alternative way to visualise a wave is in the frequency domain, that is, how much of the signal is present at different frequencies. As early as 1822, the French mathematician Joseph Fourier recognised that any wave shape, no matter how complicated, can be decomposed into a set of simple sine and cosine waves. The mathematical operation to do this is known as the Fourier transform. The work of Joseph Fourier was profound, to say the least. Not only has it been crucial to the development of signal processing and wireless communication, but also computer graphics, data compression, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and much, much more. But that, as they say, is another story. To help us understand the representation of a radio signal in the frequency domain, consider this particular example of amplitude modulation, in which the modulating wave and the carrier are both sinusoidal. The mixing circuitry of the transmitter essentially multiplies them together. That is, the amplitude of the modulating wave is multiplied by the amplitude of the carrier wave at each instantaneous moment in time. The resulting modulated wave has a relatively simple shape, as you might expect. As before, the envelope of the modulated wave looks like the modulating wave. Now, if the modulated wave is decomposed using a Fourier transform, we find that there are actually three components instead of the original two, which might seem counterintuitive. The reason for this is that when a mixer multiplies the modulating wave by the carrier, signals at new frequencies are in fact generated. One of these new signals appears at a frequency which is equal to the sum of the frequency of the modulating wave and the frequency of the carrier wave. And the other appears at a frequency which is equal to the difference between the frequency of the modulating wave and that of the carrier wave. So the mixer outputs a signal with three frequency components. The frequency of the carrier itself a component with a higher frequency than the carrier, and a component with a lower frequency than the carrier. The magnitude of these frequency components can be plotted on a chart of amplitude versus frequency. This is what we refer to as the frequency domain. The carrier frequency is the large spike in the middle. The spikes on either side are known as sidebands. It's worth noticing that the modulated wave now occupies a wider range of frequencies than the original modulating wave. Modulation has increased the bandwidth of the signal. These days, a device known as a spectrum analyzer can be used to view a signal in the frequency domain. Returning to our original modulated wave, which might be carrying voice or music, when a Fourier transform is applied, it can be seen to contain many more frequency components. And when viewed with a spectrum analyzer in the frequency domain, you could expect to see a pattern that looks rather more like this. Of course, the sidebands vary rapidly according to the content of the signal as it changes. The sidebands are always mirror images of each other, and each contains a copy of the same information. So when broadcasting, there's no need to transmit both sidebands. Some transmitters will use circuitry or software known as a filter to suppress the carrier and one of the sidebands, thereby saving power and reducing bandwidth. Amplitude modulation caught on very quickly, and soon there were lots of radio transmitters broadcasting at the same time, each operating on its own frequency band and amplitude modulation has stood the test of time. It's still in use today with AM radio stations and, as you'll see later, by modern Wi-Fi systems, albeit in combination with other techniques. 
But even AM radio waves are susceptible to disruption from electrical equipment, signal echoes and weather conditions. In fact, anything that might change the amplitude of a signal can disrupt it. In 1936, the American engineer Edwin Armstrong demonstrated an alternative method of modulation, namely wideband frequency modulation. It took many years and several court battles to develop. But when it was ready, the quality of the sound transmitted by means of frequency modulation was far superior. With frequency modulation, or FM for short, the frequency of the carrier is adjusted according to the amplitude of the modulating wave. This means a frequency modulated wave is less vulnerable to anything that might cause the amplitude to change. This is what a typical FM wave would look like in the frequency domain. As you can see, a frequency modulated wave occupies a considerably wider range of frequencies, which typically might vary by as much as 150 kHz. This is why the quality of the information transmitted by FM is so much better. These days, FM radio stations operate in the frequency band between 87 and 108 MHz. To avoid conflict with each other, each is allocated about 200 kHz of the radio spectrum. The third main type of modulation, which was also developed by Edwin Armstrong, is called phase modulation. With phase modulation, at any given instant, an increase in the amplitude of the modulating signal causes the phase of the carrier to be advanced. When the amplitude of the modulating signal decreases, the phase of the carrier is delayed. Examine a phase modulated sine wave and you could be forgiven for thinking it was frequency modulated. Advancing the phase of a wave has the effect of compressing it, which increases the frequency. A delay in phase, on the other hand, decreases the frequency. Phase and frequency are clearly inextricably linked. Therefore, phase and frequency modulation are referred to collectively as angle modulation. Remember, from a previous video, the phase of a sine wave can be described in terms of rotation around a circle. Here, you can see the result of phase modulation and frequency modulation together. These two modulated waves were generated from the same modulating signal with the same carrier. They are indistinguishable, apart from their phase difference. Phase modulation, however, has the advantage of being easier to implement. The electronic circuitry required is simpler than that needed for frequency modulation. Furthermore, in practice, particularly with digital data, phase modulation uses a smaller bandwidth than frequency modulation, which means it can carry more information for a given frequency range. These days, most of the information we communicate wirelessly is digital. And most of us don't have to look far to see evidence of this. DAB radio and digital TV have become the norm. Computers are common household appliances, and well over half of the people in the world now own a mobile phone. Amplitude and phase modulation are particularly important when it comes to the communication of digital data. In the next lesson, you'll see how this works.